Welcome to Deepen with Pastor Joby Martin. The Church of 1122 is a movement for all people to discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're praying this message helps you deepen your relationship with Him. Now let's dive in. It's beginning to look a lot he like it. Christmas. It's the inner worship pastor finally oh, rearing his head back. Or the inner Michael Buble. Oh, you know what Buble. I mean? Buble. Who doesn't like some Michael Buble? Bro, I'm telling you right now. I mean, Buble's Christmas album is yeah. oh, all time classic. Yeah. Crowder put one out last year. Well, I don't know about this. Called Milk and Cookies. I'm not even kidding. That's the okay. name of the album. It's right. my favorite Christmas album. Really? Is it Christmas Christmas songs? Uh, oh, yeah. Some of them he wrote. <laughs> yeah. Some of them are re records. Uh huh. But man, it's a, it's a jam. Awesome. Well, welcome everybody to the Deep Podcast Deep Christmas. Deep. We are we are starting this Christmas series, and of all the people in the world who love Christmas, I don't think anybody loves Christmas more than you, Ryan Britt. I'm into it, bro. Merry How Christmas. long has your Christmas tree actually been up? Uh, we put it up this year. We were a little behind this year, but the weekend, first weekend of November. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> really? Yeah. <clears throat> Not us. Are you are you a live? Is, your, tree is yours person? up now? It is up now. Yeah, we love it. I mean, I know. I mean, I love Christmas, but I just love it in its appropriate context. Right, right. Is mm-hmm. it like if it goes too long, you get too tired of it? I don't is that know. That kind of how it's it is just, for you? I don't know. I don't know. I think it's kind of how I'm with the music. Like if I start the music too early, it gets to the not Christmas yet, and I'm like, I cannot hear "Rocking Around the Christmas Tree" one more time. I don't listen to a lot of Christmas music until like the last week. Okay. I listen tonight, like getting ready for the sermon, to some like. Mm. Oh, holy nights and my worship oh, yeah, Christmas yeah. songs, the not just the mm. rah rah stuff. Mm. Well, I'm excited to dive into the the message and the stuff from tonight. Um, do you have a favorite Christmas gift in your life? Maybe as a child or just any time of your life? Yeah, man, that motorcycle that I got at my grandma's house. <laughs> I mean, I just never dreamed I would get a dirt bike. Yeah. So. It was yeah. awesome. The one you crunked up? Crunked it up. Mur- <laughs> up killed her. <laughs> Came out just, you know, uh, in like, what was it rollers? Is that what they call them? Oh, her yeah. Her hair was in rollers Curlers, and stuff. yeah. Because she was trying to look good for Christmas Day pictures. Christmas uh, Day pictures are the worst, right? You look yeah. terrible. <laughs> for sure. I don't have a favorite gift, I don't think. Okay. I don't have anything that stands out. I don't think I do either, so I don't know what that says about us. <laughs> Well, I, I love the whole thing, but there's yeah. no one gift. For right. One I have like four. One, for, I mean, I got a Mustang one year, 66 Mustang when I was 16. Mm, all right. Also, the backdrop is like my family life was terrible. <laughs> and yeah. then this, when we would go to my grandma's house for whatever, everything was perfect for just mm-hmm. like yeah. five days, you know? Yeah. And <clears throat> my dad, he, like, he'd be at Walmart on a, in July. I'm like, can I get this? Hot Wheels car, which was 99 cent. He's like, son, we can't afford that kind of stuff. I, I was convinced that we were like a half a step out of food stamps, which was not the case whatsoever. Uh-huh. And then for whatever reason around Christmas, my dad just became the most generous person. Even today, he still gives me, I mean, he spends hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars on me and Gretchen. Mm. And my kids. It's mm. crazy. He likes to give a gift at Christmas. Mm. That's awesome. So it's been wired into us pretty strong. So we're we're pretty strong gift givers like to the kids and stuff. So, I mean, I know what the answer is going to be. Uh, the the best Christmas movie of all time, in your opinion, EPK. is obviously going to be <laughs> Die Hard. Now, are, are we all of the opinion that that is a Christmas movie? Yes. That is a debated topic. Yes. And I am not... Promoting it or <laughs> saying that anyone should watch it. I'm not saying it will help you love Jesus anymore. Yeah, yeah. It will give you some more sin to be forgiven of. <laughs> so grace will abound <laughs> if you watch it. No, there's some. Uh, there's. Yeah, I didn't realize. You know, it's been a minute, or you only see it uh, like on TBS or whatever. Uh, you know, yeah. so there's that version. Yeah. And then this was years. JP was probably like 14. I'm like, dude, let's watch this movie just straight off the. Mm-hmm. The, the mer- <laughs> bit, bit shady at bit, times. Yeah, there's a couple got a little scandalous. Yep. Yeah. Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Can't debate it. I'm into. Uh, I mean, Elf's hard to beat. Elf's fun. Uh, Home Alone, oh, the mm. first one. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, hardest I ever saw my dad laugh ever was when we went and saw Home Alone. Really? Yeah. He, it was like the brother. The brother needs oxygen. <laughs> When that spider's crawling on the guy and the, the other guy hits him with a tire iron, oh, dude, dude, that's some funny stuff. So, yeah, 
That little scene where they where the little boys choir sings "Oh Holy Night," you know, and it like gets chill for a minute while he's prepping for the mm. wet bandits. <laughs> it was like it's legit. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, he has his little prayer. I'm like, uh, we didn't call this series Four, Four Christmases Christ- yeah. because of the movie Four Christmases. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a couple of characters in that movie that I think are a riot, but I'll leave it there. Uh, <laughs> Problem is I spoiled her. <laughs> I spoiled her is what I did. <laughs> anyway. I like that movie a lot. Yeah. Oh, man. I, I'm i a fan of It's a Wonderful Life, the classic. I mean, yeah. I think it's a fantastic movie, fantastic story. Um, all right, well, let's get to it. Pastor Joby, just just in case, give us a quick update. What's the series about the four... The four Christmases. There are four different accounts of the incarnation in the Bible. There is uh, what we talked about tonight was like an eternal view. So mm-hmm. we go cover to cover in the Bible. There's uh, really like Mary's view, Luke 2. There's from Joseph's perspective, Matthew 1 and 2. And then from the end of times, uh, the consummation of all things in Revelation chapter 12. And so we are looking at we're unwrapping all the different narratives in the screen. Not all, because, you know, there's some prophecies and stuff that we don't get into that much, but four different Christmas narratives. Mm-hmm. One of the things I love about the Scripture, I think, I mean, you don't, you obviously agree, but you can, you every time you read it, it has a freshness to it. And this example is that there's lots of things that kind of, they layer on top of each other in the, in the scripture and you're kind of like, where does it say that again? So then you might look at one gospel and be like, wait, it's missing this entire part and forget that you you have that narrative section filled in from some other part of it, yep. right? Um, so I'm, I'm excited to, to, to dive into each one. And today we talked mostly about a huge topic in Christian theology, and that's the incarnation of Jesus. So we're going to spend some time talking about that. Massively important. Um, so here's the first the first thing to discuss. Why does it matter so much? The incarnation, which is the event of Jesus stepping into humanity. It means with flesh. Yes. Like carne. Con carne. Asada. <laughs> Not grilled. That's what that means. Uh, <clears throat> why does it matter so much that Jesus is, became, is fully God and became fully man? Why, why does that matter so much? Yeah, nothing of his divinity was diminished in his humanity. He added humanity to his divinity. Mm. That matters a ton. Mm-hmm. What's the word for the relationship, the theological word for the relationship between his divinity and humanity? You put me on the spot, I don't know. Hypostatic union? That's it. That right? Is, it is that. Different than the hyperstatic union, which is, I think, the, the one that's incorrect. Anyway, but that's just the way That's the way they all work together. So, uh, fully God, fully man, not, w- there's a, one of the creeds says that, you know, n- not diminished in either one, like what you just said, Pastor mm-hmm. Joby. What changes about the, our faith, our belief, if that's not true, if he's not fully man? Um, it would make Hebrews untrue in that we would not have a high priest that suffered in the same way that we do and mm-hmm. is empathetic in every way. Mm-hmm. There's also this idea that his suffering on the cross would somehow be diminished because he could shift into his God majority mm-hmm. and miss out on mm-hmm. some of human suffering at the cross. Mm-hmm. It is very, very important that, one, that he is born of God, not man, Mm -hmm. in regards to his lineage, but also that he is born of woman, not just appearing out of nowhere so that he can die in our place. Mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis has a whole chapter on this in Mere Christianity. Yeah, Um, And he's just exploring how to explain penal substitutionary atonement, mm -hmm. that it takes a perfect... It takes a perfect substitute to take the place of a sinner... But in order to be a substitute, a person has to have flesh. How in the world do you accomplish it? Mm -hmm. Because a man that's a man would not, who was perfect, would not die in somebody else's place. Mm -hmm. It would take a God that became a man Mm -hmm. to choose to die in someone's place and for it to count. He says it better than I do. Uh, I was talking with my daughter. She's 10, and we were talking something about like Jesus's struggles or you know something like that and it was it, it was like we said do you think that was hard for Jesus to go through that she's like no no it wasn't hard for him 
you know. And I think, I think for a long time in my own life, I thought that like that nothing would have been hard for Jesus. Like the temptations weren't really tempting for him because I mean he's God, so right. So and and you talked a little bit about that, Pastor Joby, a few weeks ago as we were in this in the series. It doesn't make sense, right? Because and so we have to understand that those struggles were real struggles. Otherwise, it, otherwise, it doesn't really redeem our struggle, right? Yeah, I think uh, you see this exemplified in John 11 when Jesus, when Lazarus is in the tomb. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you see a real, um, you see how he's fully present, even though he does not um, put on pause his omniscience. Like he, no he tells the boys before they get to Bethany, mm -hmm. Lazarus is going to rise. And then while he's there, with Mary and Martha, he cries with them. So you're like, hold on, what gives? How do those right. two things coexist? And the reason they coexist is, one, his name is I am that I am, which means he is he is perfectly and eternally present in the right now. Mm -hmm. And so that pain was real. He's not put on a show weeping, um, even though he is omniscient and all-powerful, knowing that he is going to solve the problem and he has mm -hmm. the power to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. I think it's a pretty... A really good pic picture of fully God, fully man, in that moment. Hmm. Yeah, did he choose his limitations in becoming humanity once, or did he willfully choose them over and over and over and over and over again hmm. to truly live the human experience? Yeah. So that he who knew no sin could become sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. And so, he had he 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 had to be vulnerable to sin in every way in order to be victorious over sin without ever sinning. Correct. There's no way to do that without being fully man. And I don't think that he just chose an eternity past that I'm going to go and be a man, mm -hmm. and that I believe he would willfully put that limitation on himself over and over again, meaning could he have called down angels yes. to save him at any time or to change this or blow air and planets move? Yeah. Yes, I think he could have chosen. To, he willfully chose those limitations mm -hmm. of full humanity in order for... Hmm. Uh, full victory to be achieved, and I can't. It can never be lost on me that you know he's out there. The, the God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Spirit are outside of time. You know they don't experience time in the same way that we do. Yet he inserted himself in the time that he created to operate in that time for the sake of yeah. the redemption of all things, including time, and. It's not lost on me that he he saw this coming, right? You know, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Like the 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 I, I always have wondered in his total theological speculation. I've always wondered what it was like in heaven when he stood up. To, yeah, I tried to do when, a little bit of that yeah. tonight. Yeah, and you I'm, did. And I'm it, totally ripping Charles. Right. Charles Martin talks about that. In a really epic way. Yes. I don't spend a bunch of time. I don't, it's not like, oh, here, I'm going to rip off Charles. You know, when yeah. you hear a guy teach a lot, it just kind of gets on you. <clears throat> One of the things that you see and that you know is that his his omnipresence is evident that he put it on pause. Because when the Word became flesh, he is not currently ever present for 33 years. Today he is with the Spirit of Christ. Do you think that was... Only for that second person, like yes. So God is still omnipresent. God for sure. the spirit, or you know what I mean. Like, for sure. That's such a that's such a mind. Right, right, right. Screw. But God the Son was not. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, he was a baby in a manger, and right. he had to go to Egypt. He wasn't already in Egypt. He had to get on. You know what I mean. So the father, the father's outside of time. Time is inside the son. The spirit is operating inside of time. That's right. And. Say well, that yeah, say that ten times fast. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so the Father's outside of time. Time is inside the Son, and the Spirit is operating inside of time. Correct. And somehow he in, in, he entered the thing 
that he was he is eternally sustained. Right. <clears throat> I'll forget the. I forget the details of this. Tim Keller loves to use this as an example all the time. There was an author that fell in love with a character that he was writing and then inserted another character into the story in the book, and it was him. Mm. And he wrote it, you know, and it, he's like, it's kind of like that. Mm-hmm. Right. Like Just real. This thing that he created, he wrote himself into. Mm. And while that character that was him was in the pages of the book, it was confined to the beginning, middle, and end, and yet he was the author over the beginning. I mean, it's pretty. It's a pretty good analogy. All analogies break down, but... Mm-hmm. And it was because of this love that he had for this character that he created. So mm-hmm. he wrote himself into the story. It's pretty cool. I love the illustration. You know, you talked about this, Pastor Joby, about taking your son into the truck stop bathroom, yeah. you know. And when you said a minute ago, Pastor Britt, about willfully choosing over and over and over again. I remember having this thought, like the suffering of Jesus didn't start in the, at the passion, Mm-mm. you know? Like I used to have this pair of shoes that was like the only dress shoes I had, and they were like one size too small, but I was like, well, I just only, don't wear them that much. You know what I mean? So so you put on a suit for a wedding or something like that, you're just like, well, I can, just, I can wear them for one afternoon, but they're just so uncomfortable. You know, your feet hurt so much, and I have big feet, but... and. I think it was like that. I think like from the from the get go, like put the squeezing into the limitations of skin and in, in, in space and like even just babyhood or childhood, you know, that was a form of suffering if you're God of the universe. You know yeah, what we're I mean? way too comfortable with the baby in the manger, you know. Yeah. And that's why I went to Philippians two because mm-hmm. that he dressed himself as a servant mm-hmm. even in human form. I think the angels see that and they're like, "Wow, really?" Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. So, trucks out bathrooms, but best yeah. example I can come up with. We just don't have any version of a con- construct to live in outside of the one Christ shows us to have no regard for ourselves in that way. Mm-hmm. When when he when it says that he had no regard for himself, or yeah. that he, you know, <clears throat> that, that he he just totally was self-forgetful every step of the way for the sake of a greater love, for a greater affection, which is ultimately the Father's will and the redemption of his brothers and sisters, Mm -hmm. you know? And the incarnation is really, I mean, it's a wild thing to talk Mm -hmm. about. You know, you mentioned it tonight in your sermon, which, great job, by the way. Um, One of my favorite characters that's in the early in Jesus's life. We see him early and then we see him again later as John the Baptist. Mm-hmm. And um, when John the Baptist's mama and Jesus's mama are, are cousins. Yep. And uh, cousins or sisters? First cousins, I think. First cousins, yeah. And um it says when that John leapt mm-hmm. in his mother's womb when Mary came in pregnant, you know, so they had to be close in age and all these kind of things. And and you just think about the the intricate details that are the that happened in the incarnation that had names and like houses and they had to like be in a home together. You know what I'm saying? Like there's just just so it, the whole thing is so familiarly relational. <clears throat> in every step of the way for God to be with us. And so when you sit down at the table at the end of the sermon tonight to talk about that this this, this kind of detail is what God wants mm-hmm. in intimacy with us, mm-hmm. that it's always been that way. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like he was just doing enough. Like we can never get our head around the intricate details of how specific everything was that God orchestrated for for God to become a man. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's beautiful. And his incarnation dignifies the little details of our lives right. and causes them to be, like he can sympathize and empathize like Hebrews says, and also gives him the ability to redeem. You have another illustration that you talk about, about the ants, right? Like the, the kid who's like murdering all the ants with the jelly and stuff. And the only way to get the ants' attention is... If you yell at them as you, they're just like maybe don't maybe they don't speak human or whatever. You'd have to have you'd have to become an ant to give the to to be able to speak their language. 
And we were talking about the incarnation. One of the things you're talking about tonight got you thinking about uncomfortable shoes. It got me thinking about the time that we were in Brazil, the day that we went to Crackland. You heard that right. Crackland. Crackland. <laughs> we, we were going there to do ministry. We did not have an elder vote before our visit <laughs> we, we did not. But we had lunch with a, a friend in Rio at a very good, high-quality, 15-seat Italian restaurant. The with nicest. The nicest restaurant. It's at the Copacabana, looking at the beaches of Rio, like... I didn't actually know Copa Cabana was a real place. I, I thought it was just at the Copa. That's a real place. It's like, and there's this, you got to know somebody, and our buddy knows him, mm. and you go in, and I mean, the nicest, real, authentic, Italian, eight-course meal, I mean. Handmade. Bro. The whole thing is just unbelievable. Yeah, there's like a, yeah, a specific ravioli per day that the chef tells you about that he, he I mean, is off the yeah, charts. And we, you know, we'd been eating rice and black beans and yep. <coughs> flank steak for all the, the many days leading up. We meet our friend. We, And then we're going to do ministry in the afternoon at this place called Crackland, which mm-hmm. is exactly what it sounds like, where many dozens mm-hmm. of crackheads all live. And the crackheads live on one side of the railroad tracks in lean-tos. Just to get into this place, you had to step across 100,000 burned-down plastic cups, which is the cheap way that they smoke crack. You could not step on normal ground. You could only step on burned cups. And you're stepping over just baked people. Bodies. Like they're high or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're just unconscious from crack. Mm-hmm. And you're navigating around them. And then on the other side of the railroad tracks from Crackland are where are the, the the drug dealers yep. and the gangs that are actually selling all the crack. And we walk up on these card tables that have mountains of crack cocaine, and there's all these gangbangers with automatic weapons standing around. And, you know, I got a bag of <laughs> buttered bread, and Joby's got two Fantas because we're going to feed the mm-hmm. homeless crackheads and try to minister to them. And mm-hmm. that it's, that experience all happened inside of like. Three to four hours, we went from the nicest Italian restaurant you can imagine, mm, yeah, yeah, to literally the slum, like the one of the worst slums I've ever been in, and I've been in a share, my share. You know how Brit has like a, a way with words, you know what I mean? We lean over because we had never been there before, right? Somebody never. told us about it. <clears throat> they had they had blown up the roads so that police couldn't get like paddy wagons in there, and say, yeah, he's right. We we encounter the drug dealers first and had there's a whole thing there and, they, and we were with some people so they were nice to us it's fine <clears throat> then when we go when he says lean to's man it is like if you could find a piece of cardboard to lean against a palm bush that'd be your house and you'd be under it mm-hmm. we ran into that little nine-year-old boy anyway there's it was a lot going on and yeah. brit's like on your way to hell you crack your head on this place right here mm-hmm. just before you land in the pit mm. i mean it was as bad of a place as i've ever yeah. seen too yeah, and you're right. From the time we got up from the Italian restaurant to the time we like got to the railroad tracks was under sixty minutes. Mm-hmm. So it was like sociological whiplash for sure. Yeah, it was crazy. Mm-hmm. And right. we didn't know what we were getting into. Either way, we either way, know, we had I mean, we, we didn't plan any of these. We thought things. we could be at Olive Garden and just like you know regular, like we didn't know. And yeah, that yeah, that's a good. So he he planned it. And he left glory to come into That's right. this mess, which from his perspective, pretty tough. And to take that illustration further, it would be like the the chef of the restaurant yeah. going down to the the railroad tracks, and then everybody there is like, "Who, what do, you, who do you think you are? Yeah. You just come from Mr. Fancy Restaurant." He's like, "No, I used to live here." You know, I was born here, or what? You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I had a mentor who told me this story one time that you know he was uh, he did well later in life, you know, but he had a lot of sin in his earlier life, and he was doing ministry at this uh, this one event, and started talking to this guy, and this guy just started getting in his face, like, "Who do you think you are? Man? You don't know who you know. You don't know who I am." And and he's like, "I was in prison. I was I was addicted to drugs, you know." And all of a sudden, this guy just like, mm. "Wait a minute, we're the same." Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's the thing that 
the incarnation makes possible is that God could say that to us. I've been there. I've been where you where you are. Because if he was some far distant thing that I, he's never seen it, never been there. I mean, how how hard would it be to relate or to accept the thing that he's trying to tell us about his love? You know. Speaking of Hebrews, here's a verse: Hebrews thirteen eight. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So how did God become man without changing? If he wasn't man before, and now he's man, how is that not him changing? Because it doesn't say he doesn't change. It says he's the same yesterday. So his character and nature are the same. Physically, he got taller. 12-year-old Jesus is taller than 6-year-old Jesus. Mm. You know, his hair grew, things mm. like that. Mm-hmm. But this is talking about his the essence of who he is, his character and nature, mm-hmm. his will never changes. Mm-hmm. How we relate to him that way never, ever changes. Mm-hmm. Like he was alive and then he died. That's a change. It doesn't say that. Right, right. That, yeah. So we've got to be careful to not read too much. Just like let the verse say exactly what it says. Don't read mm-hmm. a thing over it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Hebrews is one of the most dangerous books in the New Testament to pick one verse out of. Uh, does he still feel the name? <laughs> right. And in, 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 he does not. And in, he, in Hebrews 1, it, before you get to Hebrews 13, it says that he was the exact imprint mm-hmm. of the character and nature of God right. mm-hmm. in every way. It's mm-hmm. a good question. Though. And so it's a great question, but Hebrews 1 explains Hebrews 13 mm-hmm. that... It's not about changing. It's about him being the exact imprint, mm-hmm. regardless of physical form at any given time. Well, I mean, we talked about Revelation, too, and we are going to talk more about it. But how are you a lamb standing as if slain? Like, that description, I think, tells us that there's an eternity-ness of all states to to God from a heavenly perspective, if that makes sense, right? Like, he can simultaneously be the lamb slain, but sitting on the throne, but also be alive, you know? And a lion. And a lion. And the lion of Judah. Yes. And he was slain before the foundations of time, Mm -hmm. and yet we know that it was around 33 AD on our calendar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is, I mean, just like John starts, man, he was God and with God, and you're like, whoa, 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 which one? Like, Mm -hmm. yep. And he he didn't go back to not being human, right? You talk about, like, where's Jesus right now? He's still human. Dude, I got into that part just in my own study. Like, okay, what is he doing now? Right. Like, resurrected, ascended Jesus. <clears throat> and I just, I just, I was like, all right, well, what is he doing? Okay, mm-hmm. I know Romans 8, he's interceding. Hmm. I know he's, he's warning, right? Mm-hmm. I know he's waiting because he's not here yet. And Matthew mm-hmm. 24 says, mm-hmm. the time or the hour are not mine to know. It's only for the Father. Mm-hmm. So he's waiting. And then I thought, well, where else do you find out this stuff? Well, he speaks red letter in, you know, the seven letters to the churches in Revelation. And there he's warning, he's encouraging, and he's knocking. Because think about mm-hmm. it, he's still saving. Mm-hmm. Like he's still seeking yeah. and saving the lost, knocking. Yeah. He's preparing too. Yeah. I go to prepare yeah, a place Yeah, that's right. For yeah, you. I can add yeah. that. Yeah. He's preparing a place for his for his family. Yeah. I love the I love the sections of scripture where you see Jesus post resurrection and, and see what he does. Mm-hmm. The thing that makes me so curious is I I don't think we have all the things that he said and did. Because it says like, well, he went John. to yeah, he went to Galilee for a while and and appeared yep. to all these different people. Yep. It's like, what was he doing? Right. What was he saying to him? You know, that, that we don't have it all written down. Um, oh, it's fascinating. But I love what you how you pointed that out, Pastor Joby. Like the the letters, especially in that early part of Revelation, tell us tell us something about about him now. You know, um, Revelation one, maybe the early part of chapter two, as it gets into the seven churches. It gives a real clear depiction of Jesus, and he's like holding stars in his hands. Yeah, man. Mm-hmm. And mm. John, it's it's fantastic. John just falls down. <laughs> mm. He just falls down, and that's I. You know, I think about this all the time. I think about it all the time. I cannot wait to see him. And I know that I'll do exactly what John did. I will just fall down before him. And everybody's like, I, I want to ask God this question. I want to ask God that. I, under, I appreciate what you're saying. You know, like it will be after Mountain of Transfiguration style. He touches you on the head and says, "Have no fear. Look at me." Like for if you sure. get to do, you know, mm-hmm. if you get to ask him, it's going to be after you. 
Mm-hmm. He says, I think right. as soon as we see him, we will have no ambiguity or anxieties Fact. around questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we will see clearly in that day. Right. The Bible mm. says we, we will know him, be fully known. Right yeah. now we see through a glass dimly, then we will see clearly. Right. right. I want to know what this is about. I want to know what that's about. I, I've got a question. What questions are fine and they're good mm-hmm. and they lead to a place, but ultimately the questions are all who questions. And when we right. see the who, mm-hmm. all the what's are leading to a who. Yeah, you and might so, not even need to ask the questions, kind of your point, right? The way I've explained it. And I think he's going to want to hang. Seems like it. You know what I mean? A lot of tables, like a lot of table talk from cover to cover of this thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, even like think 23rd Psalm, right? I prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. Um, and then a couple of verses later, man, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life mm-hmm. as I dwell in the house of the Lord. Forever. Those are some real close verses right there. It seems mm-hmm. like. Yeah, I mean, I think a good way to understand the whole Bible is a tr- is a Christmas word, Emmanuel, God with us. Mm-hmm. Like in in the garden, God with us. Sin cracks it. Temple sacrificial system, so that sin could be covered for a time, so that God could be with His rebellious people. Then, literally, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus put God puts on flesh in His Son, Jesus Christ, and then through the cross, forever and ever and ever and all eternity, God with us. It is. That's it. That's the I whole will box. be their God, and they will be my. That's people. right. That's it. Which is interesting. Another I, in Philippians chapter two. The reason I went to Philippians two is because when I when I did the um, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I, I just the word I wrote the line I wrote down is we don't understand the severity of that. Mm-hmm. So you're Italian to crackling, and that's a good illustration. So Philippians two, as Paul is using the incarnation. Um, as a teaching point on how humble we should be, because look mm-hmm. how humble he was. Right. He didn't just show up as a middle-class carpenter. That's not that bad. He showed up at, from the king of kings mm-hmm. to death on a cross. I mean, that's really extreme. Mm-hmm. And he ain't there now. He has been exalted at the right hand. I hope this lands on people right this week. Um, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. So... Like everybody's gonna bow. Mm-hmm. We talk about this. Oh, so you I can bow that. or bow. Yeah. But then in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess. So every single human being, regardless of what you believe, mm-hmm. one day will declare Jesus is Lord. Yeah. And some of them are going to hell or already in hell and will stay in hell, and some of them are, are in heaven or going to heaven and will stay in heaven, right? So he's he's gonna be everybody's Lord. But for some he'll be Lord and Savior, and mm-hmm. for some he'll be Lord and Judge. Yeah, I love that. But he's Lord. Yeah. Which reminds me of the Christmas carol, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Mm-hmm. Like, he is Lord. Whether Herod recognizes it or not, mm-hmm. he's Lord. Mm. Right? Yeah. Well, we tied this We tied this back to Christmas. And I think of the, you know, right before you preached, there was a, a video and kind of contrasting these different... Such a good video. These different views. I mean, Great. yeah, for the story about co and pre pre that though, it's just like you know, gifts are not just lining up at Target or whatever, right? So, why why is this such a dramatically countercultural message at Christmas? The very thing, like you say, Christ is in the name, right? Right? <laughs> like, what do you think has has led us to to get away from this central message of Christmas? I think there's a, I mean, there's a, like traditions are great until they're not. Mm-hmm. The moment the tradition, we, I taught on this last year. I don't remember it. I just looked it up today as I was like looking up some stuff. So last year we talked about being rescued from human tradition and we taught yes. out of Acts 16. Yes. And um, traditions, the point of a tradition is to point you to a thing. The thing is not the tradition, mm-hmm. Right. And so the moment the, th- the tradition becomes the thing instead of a means to point you to a greater thing, mm-hmm. you got a problem. Mm. Yeah. And that happens a ton in Christmas because now it's not just gifts, but it's also parties and songs and movies. Mm. And, like, there's a lot. And, I, mm-hmm. and, again, man, we are not a bunch of curmudgeons that don't right. do Christmas trees and— it's a wonderful life. I'm into all that stuff. You just got to be careful if you think, like when we're thinking about your best Christmas ever, man, you're thinking, I mean, like the ones we're trying to create for our families and our kids, 
you can do the checklist thing, yeah. and it's similar to the, the Shema. If you like Jesus being the point needs to pa- mm-hmm. be the paper on which you make mm-hmm. your Christmas checklist. Yeah, and it listen, this world is spending billions of dollars a day for you to not mm-hmm. care at all about mm-hmm. Jesus, but spend all the money and be real busy and. Yeah, buy in all the things. You know, what makes me think of is, uh, you know, we drive up ninety five some over into across into Georgia, and there's that there's a big like, hey, thanks for visiting Florida thing. It's it's a kind of a nice oh yeah sign, but there's all these signs that say, please don't stop and take a picture. Well, people do, uh, and people do all the time. <laughs> and uh, when you talk about like the thing in Christmas that's supposed to point you to something else, like becomes the thing itself. It's like, and so when you pull off the side of the highway, put your life in danger to like take a picture next to a thing that says Florida, you're not really getting the point. The point, like, the point is to enjoy the actual Florida or go to where the, the, you know, the rest stop or where the real sign is, you know? And that's like the worst part of all the state of Florida. It's right. on 95, right. <laughs> right next to like, what is it? A that? swamp. St. Like, Mary's. I don't know what that little yeah. inlet is, you know? It's not yeah. even, yeah, that's oh, funny. Oh my gosh. Romans yeah. 1 answers your question like this. It says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God nor give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, mm-hmm. and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. The reason people, the culturally, we've taken... Christ out of Christmas is because we don't see, savor, love, revere the God of the Bible. And we've exchanged a love for Him or a knowledge of Him for things that resemble ourselves. Hmm. And we're looking to reinforce ourselves around every corner hmm. and the purpose of our existence hmm. separate from God. Yeah. And we will even use happy holidays to do it if left our own devices, mm-hmm. not to be a curmudgeon, as we, one would say. Mm-hmm. I don't even know what that word means exactly, so I might be one. But the, Not about uh, Christmas. Not about mm-hmm. Christmas. You, <laughs> you are on track to be one in other areas, but you love some Christmas. <laughs> I do love some Christmas. Uh, but that's why Romans 1 yeah, answers it. We're good. There are few, people are futile in their thinking, and it's heartbreaking, man. It's heartbreaking. People, so the, are, people are good at like making stuff all about them. Humans, yeah. Well, yeah, we are good sure. at that. Yeah, so one of the things that helps me Speaking is, of curmudgeons, my brother is trying to FaceTime us in the middle of this podcast <laughs> right now. Tell him we're doing big things. Oh, man. From Bethlehem. He's calling you from Bethlehem. From Bethlehem, that's Literally. exactly right. <laughs> but, man, when you try to get, when I try to get my head around the vastness, the grandness, the glory of God, like you're saying, I wonder what it was like. Can you imagine from an angel's perspective, be like, oh, he's standing up, what's happening? You know, mm-hmm. why is he taking his crown off? I don't know how it works, but right. that, you know, that is what I'm trying to do in this sermon. It's the reason I started within the beginning, trying to get like that mm-hmm. big picture. Mm-hmm. It honestly, as silly as it sounds, <laughs> Speaking of dumb Christmas movies, when Elf is like, Santa's coming? Mm -hmm. He had an anticipation Mm -hmm. like the people that paid very close attention to the Messianic prophecies. Multiple people in the New Testament are like, we found him. Mm -hmm. We we found him, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so for me, backing up, and thinking about in the beginning was the word, and then li- letting that lead to baby in the manger mm-hmm. helps me really get it more than starting in the baby in the manger. Yeah, uh, I feel like you missed the point. It's like coming in halfway through the movie. Yeah, and but you don't understand sure. why the hero's winning. Do you have anything that you do personally to to make sure that the songs or the traditions are around Christmas don't don't become old or just too sentimental? I have kids that are in the fun Christmas age, and Mm -hmm. so their faces keep it from becoming rote, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, And I just, I'm into it. I'm into the whole thing. Probably my favorite Christmas memory is is not of me. It's like when we gave our kids the puppies, Mm -hmm. that was, and part of the reason it was so great too, you know, when you get a dog, you got to research, and Gretchen was concerned about allergies, so we had to do the hypoallergenic thing, and I, do, I wanted the, and those are usually pretty wimpy-looking dogs, <laughs> and so I was just trying to find the least 
wussy dog. <laughs> I didn't want anything with a doodle in it or anything like that. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> well, I know, but still, it's, I'm going. So I went with a schnauzer because they look, they look like Gretchen says they think I'm their creator because they got the beards and stuff. <laughs> and then we found a lady that goes to Bay Meadows that like raises them or whatever. Yeah. All that worked out. Well, JP, he was like on the Santa Claus side of the equation at that point. And Reagan had been asking, and he had zero idea. And we had only planned on getting one. Mm-hmm. But this sweet lady that goes to our church gave us a discount so we could afford two. So he had no idea. And when they came running down, first of all, we had convinced Reagan, we'll never have a dog. And that whole that moment mm-hmm. and the like, you know, they come and lick him in the face. And mm-hmm. I remember yeah. Reagan started crying. And we were like, those are your dogs. And she goes, like to keep? <laughs> yeah. I was like, no, just to pet them for the night. Right. Then we're taking them back. <laughs> but you know, for sure. So mm. there's there's a real uh, there's a real innocence yeah. in that. Mm. Even though I don't I don't want to be cheesy or anything, or anything, but like I I still do I want to make it a tradition with my kids where I read the Luke two on Christmas, Christmas morning. You know what I mean? And uh, like, hey, this is what this is about. We pause for a minute before yep. we even start with anything else. You Same. know, it's worth it. I'll talk to the team about putting resources in the notes. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of books we found that are good reads for kids, mm-hmm. but they're very doctrinally sound. They're oh, very cool. theologically rich, mm-hmm. um, and they get very similar to what you did tonight. One of them goes all the way back to Abraham. Mm-hmm. Or really, to creation, and then Abraham, and it just tells mm. the story, mm. but it does it in a very yeah. m- memorable way. Uh, I will, so I'll, I'll look them up and, yeah. and put them in the notes. But really helpful resources. That's a great. I want to ask a question about that. There is a book that I have for my kids called "The Garden, the Curtain, and the Cross." I don't know if you ever heard of that one, Mm-mm. but it's fantastic. Like it, it traces those symbols throughout. The, yeah. the scripture. So if you have kids, you know, maybe so 12 and under. Before I prepared the sermon. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Uh, so, Pastor Joby, I love I love how you were you were you were encapsulating basically the entire story of yeah. redemption, leading to this this critical moment. You know, and that obviously I know comes from like is fruit of years and years of work and study. You know, so let's just say there's somebody who's new to Bible study. I can remember. Earlier in my faith journey, I would open my Bible and be like, well, this is just some random story about yeah. a guy in the middle of the desert who found a sheep or whatever. Like, <laughs> And I, I I, didn't see the thread of it all or, or, or couldn't put it all together. So what kind of resources could could you or, or practices or helps? You know, you mentioned a couple, maybe there's books out there, but anything come, up, come to the top of your mind that would help somebody have that big, big view of the whole story? Uh, we're going to mention it in two weeks, but it's uh, the Jesus Storybook Bible mm-hmm. is one of the best. I know people will probably feel embarrassed as a grown person. I think they came out with an adult version where they just like adulted up the language a little bit mm-hmm. and took all the pictures out. I'm not positive. Huh. I'm not sure either. But even not, dude, just get the if you're if you're a new mm-hmm. believer, if you're new to Bible study, the Jesus Storybook Bible mm-hmm. traces the gospel from creation to consummation. Yeah. In a really, really good way. There's also uh, the Bible Project. Is that what it's called? They do the cartoon yes. things. Oh wow! That's the so like, it's killer. If you're going to, yeah, you can just YouTube it and mm-hmm. like before you dive into any book of the Bible, mm-hmm. you can get an overview, and they'll do this really cute little cartoony thing. Yeah, and that'll help you, you mm-hmm. know, kind of get your head around it. One of the things we try to do here. When we teach books of the Bible, I have several of my friends, and they're, they they kind of brag about it. They're like, we talked the Gospel of John. It took 14 years. And I'm like, well, that's kind of dumb because nobody knows what you talked about 12 years ago. So what, what we try to do when we do books of the Bible is we try to do them in such a way that you can kind of palm it, mm-hmm. you know? And if we have real long ones like the Book of Romans— um, I noticed about every five or six weeks, I would spend about 10 minutes at the beginning of the sermon reviewing at key points, like, mm-hmm. all right, let me just encapsulate where we've been. So we do that with books. Mm-hmm. But but to understand the whole meta narrative of Scripture, I think Jesus' Storybook Bible is probably the best. Mm-hmm. And it it's, is. Oh, and you, it's you, very you, bottom shelf. Yeah, you knew to ask about or, or if you're early into Bible study. Yeah. I think that, that's a great one. Mm-hmm. You know, Rick Warren put a book out years ago on Bible study methods. Okay. 
um, that really helps understand the arc mm-hmm. of it in a helpful way. The Mag Daddy of all of them. This is this is it's a thousand pager, so this is not like pick this up if you haven't read the Gospel of John yet. You know, start there. But a very helpful resource as you're deepening and growing is Graham Goldsworthy's According to Plan. Hmm. It's a meta narrative book. Yeah, wow. it, it is rich, rich, rich. There's also a book called God's... Anything by Graham Goldsworthy is going to be pointed toward the meta narrative, hmm. and it's 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 a worthy investment. There's a book called God's Big Picture by a guy named Vaughn Roberts, and it's a, it's much shorter. It's maybe two hundred and something pages, and it's that's what it's about. It's all about like, hey, how to grasp the whole meta narrative scripture: God with us, the presence of God in the Garden of Eden, in the tabernacle, in the temple and the church and then in the in the heavenly yeah. city you know well, i think the studying the bible with the inquisitive curiosity to mm-hmm. ask the question where is jesus in this mm-hmm. yeah and forcing yourself even if it's unfamiliar territory if you're reading the old testament what you do know about jesus is that he he was god he claimed to be god proved lived died on a cross and rose again three days later. Right. And so where is the testimony that you're reading pointing to toward or pointing back to Jesus? Where is Jesus in this text? Mm-hmm. That's a really good and even in the genealogies and even in some of the like, you know, the the line in the Jesus the storybook Bible is every story whispers his name. Mm-hmm. And in the scriptures he is everywhere. It is all about him. And yeah. so forcing yourself, teaching yourself yeah. to look for Jesus in every text is a really significant way mm-hmm. to see the scarlet thread through all of scriptures. Even just knowing that, right? Like if you've never heard that before, hear that. Like it's all connected. It's yeah. all about him. Not to be that sounds self promotional. You should listen to this sermon. There's a there's yes. um when I taught on Romans 3, I did a version of this because Romans 3 says um, no one will be justified by the keeping mm-hmm. of the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. Mm-hmm. So in that sermon, I did the, like, let's run through the whole Bible yep. in about 10 minutes. I, I, I try to do that yeah. several times a year. It's a it's not a dumb thing to mm-hmm. keep, like, save those sermons. Mm-hmm. And every once in a while, again, man, for the person, the, the kind of newer to Bible study person, saying, you know, what does Philippians have to do with this? Or right. what does what First Kings have yeah. to do with this? And just listen to that first, yeah. that run, and then you're like, okay, I get it. So we're, we're in the sacrificial prophetic part of the Scriptures pointing to mm-hmm. the, yes. the Lamb that was slain. But when you're in the epistles, it's... it's pointing back mm-hmm. to what has happened and mm-hmm. what it means for your life, you yeah. know, those kind of things. I know where you got that from. You ripped it off from the sermons in Acts, right? That's right. Just yeah. listen to Stephen's sermon yeah, or Paul, do, yeah. Peter's sermon. They'll say, hey, God from the beginning made the world, and then he chose Abraham. And they'll just yeah. walk through it and then yeah. up, to, up until Jesus, and they'll say, this is the fulfillment of all of it. So uh, I love that. So uh, you mentioned this too, that, there, that as you're talking through the whole narrative – that there was a time when they were uh, the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt, and that they waited for 400 years for the deliverer. Moses came. Uh, that period of time in between Malachi and Jesus is about 400 years That's right. for the deliverer, right? And so this season that we're heading into is Christmas is Christmas Day, but the season leading up to is called Advent. And we did a couple years ago a series all about the waiting and expectation and arrival uh, so talk about let's talk about that for a little bit. Like, what is this expectation of? I, I've heard I forget who said it. I've heard people say the expectation of Christ being born anew in our hearts this season. You know, how does that 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 putting ourselves in that mode of arrival or expectation and waiting? How does that benefit us? Not just about Jesus's first coming, but about his his second. So when Jesus gives the parable of the sower, you know, and the seed goes out, it's the condition of the heart, not the casting of the seed Mm -hmm. that determines the growth. Mm -hmm. And so there's a real partnership in what we do and what our folks that come to church do. And I promise we're going to do our part. Mm -hmm. We work, I mean, we're going to study, we're going to pray our worship team's writing songs. These videos that we're putting on this time are the incredible. incredible. Okay. 
So, so two things. A part of the angle we're taking this year is we are going to present the Christmas story four different ways from four different perspectives that hopefully will be new and fresh to the hearer. It's mm-hmm. not just Luke 2 every time, although Luke 2 would be great every time if that's what we decided to do. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Oftentimes, what you got to do to prepare your heart is, is just long obedience in the same direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what Advent is. Yes. You know? And you and we've talked about faith being like a muscle before, you know, it grows with exercise. Mm-hmm. And even if you've been out of it, there's mm-hmm. there's a there's a thing called muscle memory mm-hmm. that like if you if you used to have muscles that you haven't used in a while and you begin to use them in that same way, they do like quote unquote remember and will get back to where they were faster mm-hmm. than if you're starting from fresh. So the the church for Thousands of years has have different different traditions have had different strains of Advent preparation, mm-hmm. but you should do the things that stir your affections for the Lord mm-hmm. that prepare your excitement for mm-hmm. Advent. Yeah. I, th- I think some of what potentially got lost in some of the high holy reverence around Advent and the prepare our hearts anew and and some of this is. And it's all good. Like there's a real reverence to it, and there's a real seriousness to it. And it's, but there's also the the phrase I love that Pastor Joby said tonight. Probably the first time I'd ever heard this in regards to Jesus is coming was like 18 years ago. Somebody called it a landed invasion, mm-hmm. and I stole it. And everybody, I don't know. I think Ben Stewart's the first person I ever heard say. C.S. Lewis said it. He wrote and, an article about. Uh, yeah, I think I remember. Uh, that. yeah, that's yeah. right. That's but, right. But yeah, that's totally where I stole it. Stole and it uh, the phrase Five. "landed invasion." The, the, every time in my mind, I think about the boys in those steel boats mm. pulling up to the beaches of Normandy. Mm. Like right before the bullets started flying, and they they get off the big boats and they get in those steel those steel transports, and they're just heading toward the beaches of Normandy to invade. They are a landed invasion. Mm-hmm. I just think about all of that tension and all of that energy and all of that anticipation into wartime. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And and I, I, I think about that from the perspective of the heavenlies. Like, they know mm-hmm. that when the front door on that boat drops, what's about to happen. And from the heavenlies' perspective, like, there's an eager anticipation and calling, and, and y- y- there, there's just a – it's such a real seriousness to it. But it is a wartime invasion, and, and – the baby in a manger is sweet. Mm. We're going to shake that up next week. But it's war, man. That's right. <clears throat> so so thanks. Bible. Re- if you're not in the habit of reading your Bible, make Advent the time to do it. Mm-hmm. We have a reading plan every single week. Mm-hmm. Just stick with it, man. Just mm-hmm. read it. Mm-hmm. Church, don't miss church. Mm-hmm. Be here, sing the songs, worship, like get it on you. Because, again, everything in this world is trying to make it about pretty much just consumerism, right? Mm-hmm. Another thing I'd encourage you to do is, um, much like you said, <clears throat> which a lot of theologians have said this, look for Jesus on the page of every Bi- uh, in your Bible on every page. And why not look for the redemptive story in movies and music, all of them, not just, like I know Elf's just funny, but fundamentally, here's a jacked up person that wants to be re- reunited with his father. Does that sound familiar? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you could do this. If you listen to Jordan Peterson talk a little bit, he's like, the first book is the Bible. Every story you've ever heard was built off of this narrative mm-hmm. because we're lost looking for a savior. I don't care who you are. That is the story. It's the mm-hmm. story of Superman and Batman and Pinocchio, and over and over and over and over. These are some things that will help mm-hmm. tune your ears to mm-hmm. the coming Redeemer, mm-hmm. trying to look for Him all over the place. Yeah. One and, and I, one of the things I love about the approach that you're taking in this series is is that, like, I think you know we live in a pretty instant gratification society. You'd argue, right? Like, we don't like waiting for the microwave to be done, but. Uh, the How did people used to cook potatoes? I mean, for real. <laughs> it's like uh, a day. You had to plan the day before. You saw it in the video about Uganda. Oh, about yeah. About how they're cooking. Oh, that. 
on uh, the, on the that, floor in those pots. That so. stuff's terrible, by the way. That banana stuff, it ain't that good. It is an acquired it's taste. Bad, yeah. <laughs> they love it. I uh, do love it. The research will tell you, though, that anticipation is where like 90% of the enjoyment is mm. of anything, you know? And so when you talk about the grand narrative and all the prophecy and all the anticipation and waiting and the expectation that 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 would lead those people to be like, we found him. Right. We found him. Like, don't skip over that just because you know the end of the story. Like, that's part of what this season is about is to, like, get back into that spirit of, like, this is a the <laughs> most important event of all time, Jesus coming to be born, to live, to die, to be resurrected. It's kind of like know? Calvinism, and, and man. And we're still if, waiting. If you use, and we are still waiting. If you use the doctrines of grace as an excuse not to evangelize, then you have no idea what you're reading. Mm. The re- I mean, like, God's sovereign grace is motivating mm. to share your gospel, share the gospel, because it could work. <laughs> so knowing that we celebrate the coming of Christ in 25 days should motivate you to prepare. Mm-hmm. Like, if you anticipating anticipate a thing that ain't coming, or mm-hmm. maybe, maybe not, but, but how about anticipating a thing that you know is coming? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we got to see, and, and Lord willing, going to see a lot more people anticipate and see that arrival for the very first time through mm-hmm. salvation. And uh, I'm really excited for the series. And uh, just our prayer is that we would all have eyes to see and ears to hear and uh, that God be glorified. Any, any closing thoughts, Pastor Job, as we're just getting ready to wrap up and maybe say a prayer for us? Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things I don't want to do, man, is, is I think uh, pressure is often often the killer of intimacy. Mm. Like you ever really try to make a date just be so good, and you, and you know, and you're like, gosh, she's you're not liking it as much as you should. You know how much I, you know what I mean. <laughs> Same thing with presents. Like you think this is going to make my kids just finally and fully. Yeah, understand I'm the greatest dad of all time, mm-hmm. and you're like, well, okay, you can get that way at church around Christmas, mm-hmm. not just with like trying to create the perfect Rockwell Christmas for your own family, but you can do it with your faith. Mm-hmm. You're like, well, I came to church and my, you know, didn't blow yeah. my hair back or whatever, right. man. You know, one of the real signs of true intimacy is a lack of pressure. Mm-hmm. You know, mm. and so if anything, I mean, he's called the Prince of Peace. And uh, he ain't pressuring you. Mm-hmm. He's just knocking and inviting you. He wants to sit down at the table, mm-hmm. take as long as it needs. Mm-hmm. So use this use this season mm-hmm. towards that. Yeah. I also think that's where some of the uh, liturgical Advent stuff lost its steam. Honestly, man, there was a day for everything the whole year. You're like, what, what color now? Oh, we're in purple. No, now we're in red. And mm-hmm. today's this day, and you got to, pr- you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it, something got lost during this season. Right. Um, so whatever stirs your affections mm-hmm. for the coming Christ, man, do those things. Take the pressure off. Mm-hmm. You know, your most intimate relationships mm-hmm. are the ones you also feel the least pressure for, like, performance mm-hmm. and pretending. Yeah. That should that should also apply to your walk with Jesus. You don't have to manufacture it. Correct. You know, because what? how real is it if you've manufactured it, right? Mm. You want to pray for us? Yeah, I'd be happy to. <clears throat> uh, Father in heaven, Lord, we uh, we pray by the Spirit in the name of Jesus, and we thank you that you would love us so much that you would send your only begotten Son, second person of the Trinity, to dress himself in humanity, to suffer and to serve us for your glory. And God, would you prepare our hearts that we would treasure you before all things mm-hmm. and... Uh, In this season, by the power of your gospel, may you use this church to open many, many, many eyes to the landed invasion and the Redeemer that is Jesus Christ. Mm. We pray in his name. Amen. 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 Thank you for listening to the podcast, (laughs) The End.